Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Crozet United Methodist Church. I'm Sarah, the pastor here, and this is our third Sunday in Advent worship service, contemporary and traditional, because on the third Sunday of Advent, we combine both our chancel choir and our praise band and vocalists. And so today we're going to be doing a festival of lessons and carols, and we're very excited to have you here. Things are going to be a little different from either of our normative orders and our contemporary or our traditional service, but we're going to walk you through all of that. And we are so glad to have you with us, whether you're watching us live stream, pre-recorded, or you're here in our sanctuary. We are very thankful to have you with us for today. So you'll notice that a number of people are wearing pink, including the choir. Many of them have it underneath their robes because today we're going to light our third candle, which happens to be pink. And it signifies that today is Gaudete, which means rejoice in Latin Sunday. And that's what we're going to do. So we're going to begin by lighting that candle and with prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God of joy, you bless us in so many ways. We have more than enough reason to rejoice, and yet you continue to pour out upon us those gifts of grace, mercy, and love. And for this, we are grateful. So this day, we will fill not only this home, but this world with our hymns of praise and our songs of rejoicing, so that others will know how grateful we are, and so that they too might find an opportunity to join their voices with ours. As we celebrate, the annual arrival of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We move ever closer to that day, and our hearts continue to grow and expand, to be perfected by your love, so that day by day we begin to express ourselves as Christ has done for us, offering forgiveness, reaching out with acts of kindness and mercy, and imbuing all that we do and all that we are with your love. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. And we're actually going to begin this morning with children's time. So if there's children that want to come forward, we're going to invite you to do that because I do have some things I want to show you. If you're feeling comfortable doing this, come on down. Come on down. Good morning, ladies. How are you? So you all have your Advent bags, right? And in there for today are some glasses. Now, I don't have, hi, come on up. I don't have those exact same glasses. I have these glasses. I have a permanent version of them, right? Did you look through your glasses? If you look through your glasses, does the world look regular? No. It looks rainbow, right? You're going to see rainbows around all the lights. And so that's one of the reasons why today I'm going to talk to you about some things that we see differently because of Jesus. So one are the lights. So most people will go, we just need light so that we're not in the dark or so we can read or do the things that we have to do. But in the church, we look at lights because they remind us that Jesus is the light and that no matter what happens, God's light shines for us. That's why I gave you those cool glasses. But we also have up here, you see the arrival of our poinsettia tree? Now, you might just say, that's a bunch of flowering plants, but... I drew a picture of one of our poinsettias here, but you can see that the top flowers almost make a star. And so when Christians first came to Mexico, they saw these amazing plants. They didn't have trees like they had in Europe or in North America, but they had these really cool tropical plants. And they said, hey, let's use these in our Christmas celebration because they remind us of the star that came when Jesus was born. And so we have over 70 here. We have 70 plants here to make our tree so that when you look at it, you can think of, of the plant very differently. And so what we hope is, instead of using an instrument today, we're going to be using the instrument of our voices to sing. But if you didn't bring your glasses and you would like, I have individually wrapped ones. Would you like glasses for today as well? You're absolutely welcome to have. Would you like one? Awesome. And there's bags in the back for you guys, for you and your sister for after church. Oh, yes, my dear. Here you go. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Oh, hey. Would you like glasses too? Absolutely, ladies. Here you go. Because there's nothing better than putting on glasses and looking at the lights. Okay. Now, if you want to stay, we're going to be singing a lot of songs, but if you feel more comfortable going 
with Miss Whitney and going back for children's time, you're welcome to do that too, okay? And if you start out here and you get a little restless, you can go back into the fellowship hall for children's time too, okay? All right, all right. So we're going to let you make those decisions. And either way, we will see you back at the end of our worship service. Come out of the woodwork for glasses. Awesome. <laughs> so as I mentioned, today is our Festival of Lessons and Carols, and I wanted to introduce exactly what that is. It's actually a part of our United Methodist Book of Worship, which is another one of our holy books that we use to help us organize our worship services and follow our liturgical calendar. And there's a preface to the Festival of Lessons and Carols that says this, in 1880, E.W. Benson, then Anglican Bishop of Truro, England, composed a festival of nine lessons and carols based on ancient sources for Christmas Eve. And in 1918, it was adapted for the chapel at King's College in Cambridge by its dean, Eric Milner White, who also wrote the bidding prayer. The blessing after the Lord's Prayer, added by Milner White, was first included in its present form in 1930. And the nine lessons given here were customarily used in recent years at King's College, and the service has been edited for United Methodist congregations around the world. We're not doing it exactly as it had been done, so we have our own Crozet United Methodist spin on it. And as we begin this morning, you're going to have opportunities to hear the musical offering from our praise teams, and you're going to have the opportunity to join in in some of those classic carols and hymns that we sing. But we want you to know that you do not have to continually rise and sit down. We have kind of left that Catholic Anglican past behind us. You are welcome to stay seated. And we will be beginning this morning with hymn 250, and our, con our choir here is going to process in as we sing together once in Royal David's City. Let us begin our lessons and carols. first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2 and 6 7 the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light those who lived in a land of deep darkness on them light has shined 
for a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. verses 1 through 4 and 6. 
A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. This next song the praise band sings, it's not a classic Advent and Christmas song, but it does profess the need for all to declare the glory of God as his kingdom reigns over all the earth. His blessing and honor are for all, as is the birth of the Christ child. Please enjoy Ancient of Days. Thank you. 
is from Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 to 35, and verse 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Please join us in singing next. Uh, hymn number 215 in the hymnal and the words on the screen to a maid engaged to Joseph.
Our fourth lesson is from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and 3 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Christina Rossetti gives us the most beloved Christmas hymns, first published as a poem, A Christmas Carol, in January of 1872. It then appeared as a hymn in the English hymnal in 1906, where it was paired to a tune by the famous English composer Gustav Holst. The poem invites us to offer our own gift to the Christ child, just as his shepherds and wise men did. Rather than the present of a lamb or expensive gifts, however, 
we offer the most important gift, our hearts. Please enjoy the choir singing this old English hymn in the bleak midwinter. Our first, first fifth lesson is from Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see... I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. Please join us in singing hymn number 229 from the United Methodist Hymnal, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. Thank you.
Our sixth lesson is from Luke, chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. Please join us now in singing hymn 218 from the United Methodist Hymnal, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. Our seventh lesson is from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Please listen as Deb Short sings A Night of Silence and join in when we sing Silent Night.
So that is one way of celebrating a festival of lessons and carols, and it's designed to alternate between scripture and the songs that uplift our hearts, sometimes the songs that we know so well, but framed with scripture, hopefully get a little bit more of the nuance of what is happening in those songs. And so today we've had the opportunity to journey from the prophecies about the Messiah, that the Savior would be born, all the way through those wonderful events from the Annunciation of Mary through the opportunity to sing about the birth of Christ itself. And so it is wonderful each year in this time of Advent to make that journey, a musical journey, that helps both our hearts and our minds and our spirits draw ever closer to Christmas Day. We are so thankful for all of you who are a part of this, and I continue to marvel at how wonderfully two completely different worship styles are able to meld together through the hard work and the diligence of our chancel choir and our praise team. But we can't end a festival of lessons and carols without singing Joy to the World. So we're going to invite you to stand as you are able as we sing this one. You're going to need all of your body to do that. It is number 246 from the United Methodist Hymnal, Joy to the World. incredible gift. Will you join me in thanking them for all of their diligence and their hard work? Thank you. Thank you. You do far better than I could in proclaiming that message. But as we've been joining and, and coming back together and journeying through Advent together, We've been going over a series about the different generations. I've had the opportunity to share with you what I have learned about the greatest generation, the silent generation, and today I would definitely be remiss and also harassed if I forgot the baby boomers, right? I know, I know. Everybody's like, I can't wait to hear what you say about us next week. So here we go, right? Let me talk to you a little bit about the baby boomers and 
right now in our culture, it seems like there's a war of generations between baby boomers and millennials. And I don't think that that's a fair assertion at all. Um, as I've shared with you previously, my mother is a baby boomer. And so she is part of those who were born between 1946 and 1964. I'm not going to tell you exactly when because she would kill me. But these are the post-World War II baby boom. They are those who experienced education reforms and grew up doing, with the ideology of the Cold War. They believe in progress, improvement over time, and that is very Methodist going on to perfection. They are more adept at scientific and analytical thinking than any other generation before them, which has brought about improved nutrition, higher literacy rates, better educational opportunities, and all of this from a rising standard of living that they were gifted to receive from the hard work of the generations before them. They have given to American culture specifically, and in some cases the world, the sexual revolution. Feminism, birth control, economic power of the middle class, and evangelical Christianity. 78% of them count themselves as Christian. 62% say that they have encountered spiritual peace. And 42% have left the religion into which they were born. So they are a generation that has experienced not only the power that they have collectively, but also they have experienced the way in which they are now challenged by some of that power. And how do they find a place where they fit? More than any other Christian generation before them, they experienced the autonomy of choosing how they express their faith and those with whom they choose to be expressive with in the church. And so they have found a diverse spectrum of Christianity. There are those who have become Roman Catholic, even though that was not their background. There are those that have left the Roman Catholic Church. There are those that felt that there was no such organization that truly expressed how they experienced the grace of God, and so they were the ones that first gave us that base of evangelical Christianity. And I want to be very clear that even though United Methodism does not consider itself evangelical Christian, we certainly understand the beauty of being both evangelical and Christian. We just tend to express that slightly differently in the United Methodist tradition. But when you look at what baby boomers have accomplished and how they believed that education was truly an opportunity to transform the world, they are very much in that Wesleyan tradition. John Wesley was at Oxford University, not just studying, but serving there as an Anglican priest. And he and his brother Charles Wesley and quite a few other of those early Methodists were looking and educating themselves and striving to find a way to better express how they understood Christianity. They lived in a culture where everybody had to be Christian. You were in England, you were going to be Christian by not just the law of the church, but by the law of the monarchy. And they also believed that it wasn't enough to simply go to worship on Sunday. They wanted to be Christians all day, every day. And so they were striving to find a way, a mechanism, and the holiness movement enveloped them. And they carried the holiest, holiness movement into the way that they thought and acted, their missions and their ministries, and that stretched far beyond the borders of England. It came here to what was first the American colonies and then the United States of America. And through generations, Methodists have found themselves the ability to use the gift of the rational mind to not only combine with their personal experience and our corporate experience, but to look at things differently, to find better ways of being a United Methodist, to find better ways to express our Christianity. And we owe so much to the baby boomers as a denomination and as a religion in Christianity. They have truly helped us to look at things in a different way. And as we said before, unfortunately, our eyes only allow us to look this way. But when we gather together, and especially in the numbers that baby boomers allow us to gather in, we're able to see a much fuller picture. And I have tried to go back and look for a scripture that I feel like really embodies each generation. 
And this is the one that I think speaks most truly to the heart and the spirit of our baby boomers. And it comes from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 10 through 16. For to this end we toil and struggle, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. These are the things you must insist on and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhorting, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you through prophecy, with the laying of hands by the council of elders. Put these things into practice. Devote yourselves to them, so that all may see your progress. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Continue in these things, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. May all of those within our lives who count themselves among that baby boomer generation feel the recognition of we who are the body of Christ. That you have encouraged us to grow in wisdom and in knowledge. You have encouraged us to find our place, not only within a church, but in the world. You have given us a boldness. You have not only increased our numbers, but you have increased our awareness. You have made us question practices that involve the shunning of individuals who were different. You have made us question what real inclusion looks like. And above all, you have made us examine the ways in which sometimes the church just fell lockstep with culture and society when we are certainly called at times to be a voice crying out in the wilderness. And so if you yourself are a baby boomer, I hope you will feel the gratitude of the other generations. If you yourself are a baby boomer, I hope that you will continue to be the vessel of Christ that you are and that is unique to your generation. But above all, if you know and are fortunate enough to love a baby boomer, I hope you will take today and the days ahead to acknowledge that and to thank them, for they have certainly and with great rapid pace changed our world, and they continue to do so. They remain a vibrant and active part of church leadership, not just across the globe in our denomination, but here in our United Methodist Church, and they continue to be those who ask us to look deeper to call and to question what we do, and are we being consistent with who we say we are? And so for that, we have been made better by the generation of baby booners. And above all, they continue, above all things, to tell us that Christ is vitally important. Not just what we think we know or how we feel, but how we express that in our mission work our ministries, and our worship. Thanks be to God for our baby boomers, for you are surely a blessing to us in abundance. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you that yesterday was a very long day, and some of you remarked about the fact that you had driven by the church and you saw an abundance of cars, a plethora of cars, if you will. And that is true, because yesterday we hosted... A funeral. I didn't officiate it, but myself and our director of communications and our director of music and arts kind of staffed it for these people because there was an individual who died and several houses of worship refused to have his funeral. And so a friend of the family came here last Sunday in between worship and asked us if we would host. And of course we said yes because we believe that every single person is a beloved child of God. We believe that every single person is a being of sacred worth. And we believe that every single person should be commended to God's capable hands. And so we hosted this funeral. And in the midst of the funeral, a participant decided to give the testimony of the struggle of how hard it had been to find a place that would host them. And so they gave credit to us, but then they went home and got on Google and left us a review. And I don't know that I could better sum up how I want this church to be received. This is what they wrote. 
Crozet United Methodist Church is a church for everyone who loves feeling love. Wonderful. Thank you. And that is the statement that they have put out on the internet about you. That is what your gifts have enabled them to experience. Every gift makes it more possible for us to host, to be hospitable, and to show people love. And we thank you for that. And as we are moving into this time of worshiping the Lord with our tithes and our offerings, I want to share with you this vision statement. This was something that was discussed and discerned prayerfully by our church council last month. And this is the vision for next year, which is quickly coming upon us. It says this, that for 2022, we, Crozet United Methodist Church, invite every person in worship to connect to a small group that commits to planning and offering one mission project to the greater Crozet community. Now, there's a lot of breadth and width and space for being creative there. And it's built entirely upon our mission statement, which we've read for a couple weeks. And it's about taking love, grow, and go, which is how you can sum up our mission statement, and really putting it into action. So if you're a part of our worship, but you're not yet connected to a small group, perhaps this is the Holy Spirit inviting you to consider what a small group that is bound by Christ might look like. And then together, ponder, what might you do to bless this community? And if you're a part of a small group, but you're not regularly a part of our worship, then we would encourage you to step up a little bit more into that. And above all, that by the end of 2022, more people, households, and neighborhoods in this beloved place will say, yes, I know Crozet United Methodist Church, for they have blessed me too. And with all of that hope and that expectation and deepest gratitude, let us worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Oh, cool. Yeah, we don't need to raise it. Hey, John, this is uh, our latest ministry moment. I I'm Bart Isley, the communications and marketing director for the church. You'll often see me in the back of the sanctuary uh, running around because the computer has decided that it doesn't want to worship the Lord as much as we do this particular morning. Our communications ministry is, was taken to a professional level over the last couple of years by Doug Gaskell, who's in the back and probably hates that I've said that now. Uh, he did a tremendous job, dedicated countless hours to the church, and he deserves to be celebrated for that effort. Because of his efforts, I was blessed to be asked to serve as the church's full-time communications director this summer, a staff position funded by your giving. Your giving helps provide us the resources to take worship online during the pandemic, and those gifts have helped us consistently improve that worship experience. We serve through online worship an average of 75 people a week. Obviously, that number was much higher before we were all able to come back in person. This also had a wider impact than we can measure as a way for potential visitors to check us out, to see the kind of community that we're building. We have people that are exploring membership in this church just based on the online experience. That's so exciting. Um, it's exciting for me. Hopefully it's exciting for you too. Uh, we've been able to get the church's efforts to help Dominga and Belize through Pathlight publicized simply by telling our story, telling people in the community about some of the amazing things your efforts and your giving are making happen. That's one of the many ways we can grow through the communications ministry, and your giving makes that possible. So thank you for those efforts and gifts. I'm excited for what we have in store in 2022. I think it has the potential to be a special year in the life of this church, and your giving makes that possible. Thank you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we truly rejoice in you and because of you. We are so grateful for all that we have and all that you present before us as opportunities and experiences. May we learn to embrace them. May we continue to be bound together, not only by our desire to be a part of this incredible family of faith, 
but our support with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. For, Lord, there are so many that do not yet know just how blessed it is to be a part of a family of faith like this one. And it would be too selfish of us not to share that opportunity, that invitation, and that gift. We thank you, for we are yours, redeemed by your gift of the cross, and always carried through our days by the presence of the Holy Spirit, and by a bond that is deeper than blood, that of the Spirit of us, united for our faith, our hope, and our love of Jesus Christ. May it be so for others as well. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to share with you some quick announcements, and the first is that our Christmas schedule is available, and so if you're wanting to look, look, Bart even took the candles and made them like ours. That's how awesome Bart is. Okay, because I was like, why are they purple? Ours are blue, so Bart fixed it. So you can see here, we're going to have our 4 p.m. family-friendly children's worship, um, and the kids are going to be able to come. Our middle school youth are presenting a play, which is amazing. You're going to have the opportunity to see that. 7 o'clock as our contemporary worship, led by our praise band and our vocalists. 11 p.m. is traditional worship. Both the 7 p.m. and the 11 p.m. will include candlelight. This year, we are not going to do communion because... Things are still in flux, and with visitors coming, that can be quite a a crazy experience. So we will bring that back, hopefully, next year. On Christmas Day, we have a 2 p.m. contemporary worship. This is the day that everybody gets to come in their pajamas, and kids get to bring a toy. You can come. We've moved it to 2 p.m. so that parents can get a cup of coffee or do whatever they need to do, and we can still make it. And then on the next day, the 26th, which is a Sunday, we're going to do an 11 o'clock traditional Christmas worship. So we'll have that here so you can do both. In fact, you could do all five and not hear and experience the same thing. I will be doing this. Gary will be doing this. Bart will be doing this. If you would like to join us, then God bless you. We present that for you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask us. We'd love to discuss that. We will have nursery care for the 4 and the 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve. And then my Bible study has been live streamed throughout the pandemic. Previous to that, we were meeting in person in the fellowship hall. We are going to transition back into that small group model in January. So um, for the week of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we're not meeting. The week after that, we're not meeting. We're going to pick up in January live in the fellowship hall, 5.30 to 6.30. And then uh, hopefully we can see some of you back who have been waiting for that. It's a whole different dynamic, and we look forward to returning to that. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. Apparently, that's what it says. Reach out to me. I also want to remind you that uh, we have had over the past few weeks our English Meadows Angel Tree, and many of you have taken those tags for items to bless our neighbors over here. And we want to make sure that if you've taken those, that you bring them back. They need to be back next Sunday. And if you're still looking for an opportunity but don't have the time to shop, you can contact the church office or on the church blog, find out how to have those ordered online and ship them directly so that Bonnie Gibbs, who is our coordinator, can make sure that they get over there in time. And thank you to all of you that have already brought them back impressively wrapped. Our middle school youth fellowship is today. They're going to meet at 530. They're going to do their white elephant game and apparently leveled up hot chocolate. I hope that means drinking the hot chocolate, Bart. Okay, good. Very good. I never know with you. The game is intended to produce some hilarious, entertaining gift openings, so there will surely be some questionable gifts in the mix. No, what? What does that mean? Okay, I'm going to pray for us. Students are encouraged to bring a wrapped gift. Under $10 if you buy it can totally be a re-gift. Please don't spend a lot of money. We have extra gifts, so if you didn't have time to buy a gift or your youth doesn't have time to do it, please don't let that keep them from coming. We, they're going to get to play. Um, they can just reach out upon arrival or before Sunday, we'll get it taken care of, or today, we'll get it taken care of. If you have any questions or you want to get involved, you can email youth at crozetunitedmethodist.org or talk to Bart in the back. Um, And so we're just so grateful for all the ways in which our small groups are actually no longer small. They're getting very large, and pretty soon they'll have to spin off and create other groups, which is exactly the model that is given to us in the book of Acts. We are so grateful for you and your presence this day and the opportunity to sing the songs of our faith. And we look forward to coming even closer to that as more and more of our young families are able to return and as more and more of us are finding ways to navigate safely and comfortably how to come back together and worship. And we're looking forward to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And we hope that no matter what your level is, that you will find some way, whether it's in person or live, to engage with us so that we can all celebrate together what Christmas means to us. So we have completed our singing for the day, but I hope you found at least one song that you want to sing. 
over the next day, probably one that's stuck in your head, right? And so you'll be able to continue to sing and offer that up to the world as a proclamation that Christmas is truly coming. So I'll invite you to stand as you are able as I give you your final blessing this day. No matter what generation you are, you are a child of God. You are beloved. You are of sacred worth. And in a world where so many have received a message that they are worthless and unwanted, may you be a vessel to them, pouring out love, forgiveness, and grace, and sharing with them the divine, eternal truth that every single person is precious in the sight of God. Go forth to be a vessel of our Lord and Savior who came to love and not to condemn. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen.